Hello. There was much to do during the month of March, wasn't there? And of course, it still hasn't finished yet. But one of the jobs I just thought I'd get out of the way with today was to get the hoops on in preparation to net these strawberries. Now, it's one of those things that I often forget to do. Yes, March is very busy. April, for me, I find even busier. There's even more to do. And then the next thing, there's strawberries on these as we get to the end of April and we haven't netted them. And the birds tend to get them then before we do. So trying to get ahead. And as we go around the garden, you often see that we use the fleece and the mesh. That's great and they do the jobs that they need to do there, but they wouldn't be appropriate for here. We need slightly larger holes in order that all of the bees and other insects that are in our garden can actually pass through that netting to help pollinate these flowers. Now, in today's video, we are going to be taking a deep dive into our early spring Nudig Garden. Hello and welcome back to the New Dig Norfolk Gardener. Now you can probably see that Mrs W has given me a bit of a haircut. I was just putting the, uh, the hair that was cut from my head onto the compost heap. We do like to try not to waste anything and you know, human hair and indeed pet hair will compost down really well on your compost. Uh, we would like to thank you for all of your lovely comments that we've had over the past two or three videos because two or three have come in quite quick succession um, and that's because there was so much to do. Um, so we put our onions in, put our cabbages in and our calories in. But a lot of you were really quite concerned that those plants were so small. Now it's something that myself and Mrs W have been doing for some time now so um, it's nothing new to us but I do get it because when we actually first tried doing it, we thought, oh, this doesn't look quite right. But let me assure you that they are looking fine. And as we start this deep dive into our early spring new dig garden, let's start in pop one first. As you can see, they've settled in really nicely. Indeed, they've even put on some growth. You can see that they've settled down now and when they went out they had just had these two leaves and it's now getting the third so that tells me they've finished their sulk because they always like a little sulk when you first put them in after all it was nice and warm in the polytunnel wasn't it not so warm out here and just by way of comparison i just wanted to show you this is one of the plants that mrs w actually potted up these are potted up because they're going to family members and friends around the village. And as you can see, the same thing is happening there. It's now getting its third leaf. And this has been in the polytunnel along with the rest of its friends. So in there uh, we have our potatoes, Casablanca, first early. And then here in bed one, in plot one, I'm not going to pull this all the way up, but if I just take this off. This is where we transplanted the onions. You can see they've also taken really quite nicely. And they're on their way. multi sown as you can see, there's probably five or six in there and we shall eventually thin those down to just four. Now, onions are quite fine with the frost. They've got no problem with that, uh, but the cold winds that we can get during March and April, they just need to be sheltered from them. Not going to kill them, but it will check them and their growth will slow right down. Where it's like a mini greenhouse under there with a fleece. And 
that'll just keep those winds off. Now you can see here that the radish that I popped in here, they're coming along. Um, but when we actually go into the greenhouse, the ones in the greenhouse are much more advanced. Some birds have quite clearly had a nibble. I would say pigeons. I've had bits and pieces of a nibble, but they are still growing and we shall get radishes. But I don't mind that so much because we'll be able to start eating very soon the ones that we have in the greenhouse. And by the time we're finished eating those, these are going to be ready for a harvest. And these go in a place where I'm not, then it's not a dedicated strip of bed here. I just decide what I'm going to put into these spaces around the various beds in the garden. You can see we're now going to go to plot two, but the beetroot, the same thing. A nice row of beetroot down here, multi-stone beetroot. They're largely unaffected by pests. I know some people do have trouble with birds that will peck them. Sparrows and such like. But, uh, we don't tend to see that so much. Pigeons are our nemesis. Now, over the back in plot two, Charlotte potatoes. And they'll just take a little bit longer than the first earlies. And then in the rest of this are our main crop potatoes, which are Maris Piper. Now, here in plot three, and in bed three, this is where we have our broad beans. And you can see they're doing really well and they've all tillered, i.e. they've all got more than one stalk. So that means we should get quite a bumper harvest. And, you know, they're even, they're not long before they're flowering. You can see this flower's even out. It's just not seeing enough sunshine at the moment to open itself out. But they've all got flower buds on them. So they're well on course really pleased with those. However, in bed two, last June and July, if you remember, we planted out some cauliflowers. One variety was supposed to harvest in March, the other in April. But these plants had, well, have had a really difficult start to their life. Um, they were sown and kept in our polytunnel. We went off on holiday, unbeknown to us. Um, we think it was the cabbage moth, don't we? That's managed to lay its eggs on those, yeah, on those young plants. And uh, as they start to get bigger, the leaves were being eaten. We were virtually out here every day for a fortnight or more just trying to get rid of these caterpillars. They were tiny little things, weren't they? They really were, as you say, it was, you know, first time I've ever experienced that. And then of course we had the scorching temperatures and zero rainfall for about six weeks. December, we had the big freeze, minus nine, minus 10. And then of course we had a repeat performance during January when it got, we had another cold snap, not for quite so long, but another cold snap of minus five, minus six, and then that then did for these plants. And you can see the state they're in, we've deliberately left them in here so you can see exactly what happened to them. So these were, they were the snow march, the ones that we lost the whole roads. And... Yes, the snow march we didn't see anything of. But I think it was Mandy I was speaking to on the comments, and she was telling me how her brassicas, I think it was cabbages, and she was saying about how they weren't looking too sharp after that cold spell, but they're actually now starting to pick up. And actually, that's exactly what's happening here. This is a variety called Aylesmere. We've got about three plants that we're probably going to get. And we've gone from what you just saw, and thinking we're not gonna get anything, to hang on. Hang on, Mrs. W. Looky here. We've got a cauliflower on the way. Yay! <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so we shall 
get some cauliflower to have during what we what we call the hungry gap. So it does work. You can grow things and you can get harvest at this time of the year. What we need to do is to take better care of them and be better parents to our baby plants when they go in in July. And then we can have a whole row of harvest like this. Which just goes to show you you can be gardening for many years. You can have just started. Not everything always goes the way you think. We are at the mercy of the weather, the seed that we buy. There are so many variables that can affect what our harvests are like. All we can do is to try and mitigate them as much as we can. And then here in bed one, in plot three, this is where our outdoor garlic and shallots are. And yeah, they're looking quite good and healthy. There's one or two shallots that have succumbed to the weather. I think they've probably rotted off. You can see there's one here that's not really come to much. Plot four. Uh, in here are some more onions. It mirrors exactly what's in plot one. So I won't lift those up. The same varieties and the same amounts in each. These are where we sowed the carrots in the last video. You saw us sowing carrots in the March extra. And you should see the rest of this space here as we get towards the end of the month I'll get another row in here. As we get to May and June, then we start putting our main crop carrot in here. So that's why that is bare at the moment. And then this glorious stuff here, purple sprouting broccoli. In this row is our Rudolph and we're still getting lots of harvest from this. And you know, really a gardening year is about successes and things you know that didn't go quite so well this plant on the end here we had some quite violent wind during i think it was the month of january and this sort of went over and it snapped the plant you can see here where it snapped and i think oh that's the end of that but actually look at it it's still desperate to give us some lovely purple sprouting broccoli spears and then I'm really super excited because this variety is our claret. And that's now producing its central head. Indeed, it's already sending up its side shoots, which are running all down the plant. So, you know, we're really excited about getting that. Never. We've never grown this variety before, but we've heard from many of you, um, in particular, Young Ken over there in Wales, he told us about how great this variety was. We've grown it and we're really looking forward to tasting this. From what I can see, it's going to have an absolute abundance of harvest, more than the Rudolph. Doesn't necessarily surprise me because Claret is an F1, so it's probably been bred to give a bigger harvest. As long as that taste is there, hey, then we've found something really quite special, haven't we? Or, as I said, you guys have already found it. But by telling us about it, we've been able to grow it too. <laughs> Mrs W has obviously been in here. She's decided to put some strawberries into a hanging basket. Hmm. Nice job. I can see these ones too, you know, are actually starting to develop some flower stems. Yeah. Yeah. Look. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nice fresh growth. These were some of last year's runners that I took off. Ah. So clearly you know, we're in the greenhouse, um, and you know mixed bag here with whatever we're doing. So let's start with the sowings first. Peas. We've had problems with getting these peas to germinate, which I can't say I've ever had a problem with peas before. Now, whether it's the seed, whether it's the compost they don't like, I really don't know. And I don't normally soak peas or beans, not at all. And I'll just put them into the compost and let them grow away. 
But we were so desperate and wondering why they weren't uh, germinating that we actually did soak some peas. But still, germination is really, really patchy. And I can only think that it's the seed in the main. Because what we can never know is how old a seed is. It might say that it was put into the packet, you know, January 2022. But it doesn't mean to say that that was when that seed was saved. Which is another reason why we want to start saving as much of our own seed as possible. So that we actually know just how fresh that seed is. And it's something I said we'll keep coming back to. So we'll keep referring to it, certainly all the way through this growing season. And I've dedicated some space down there. Remember, we made that new new dig bed last year. But I've dedicated that space to get some of varieties in, in order that we can just let them grow and run to seed on purpose. Peas are one such thing. Mrs. W has actually sown what one, two, three, four, five. There's five peas there of the Alderman variety that we like. And I shall simply put in two or three canes into a wigwam in that space and just let them grow and do whatever they want to do. And then when the time comes, we shall then pop that seed, dry it off and keep it for next year. But as I said earlier when we were outside, for every failure, there's a success. Now I was looking on our channel last night and I can see that a lot of people have been watching the video how to sow shallots. Now we made that video last March but there was never ever any follow-up to it. And there was a good reason for that. Not one single seed germinated. Now I did write to the company where we got the seeds from and to their credit, they did send us another packet of seeds, but it was a bit late in the season then by the time we got them to actually sow them. But I used that seed at the beginning of this month, and you can see we've had good germination. So if you did watch that video last year, that's the beginning. We'll complete it this year and you'll, you'll see us when we plant these out and, <laughs> and what sort of uh, harvest we get from this. It is a variety called Zebrun. Some of you may well have grown this before because it is quite a popular one for people to grow from seed. We generally grow all of our shallots from our own sets. So the sets, I mean, the Jamor that I've got, I've probably bought those sets five, six years ago. And all I do is keep 20 back to go in there. And for these, yeah, I do want to see what they taste like what they, uh, and, and how they uh, behave. But equally, I want to try and get to a point where I've at least got 20 of these that I can then use as sets to put elsewhere in the garden and have a different variety of shallot. Provide myself and Mrs. W like it. I can see that. Mrs. W has been sowing her flowers and these are mostly tagetes and marigold. They are self-saved seed and it just goes to show you the benefits of it. You know, the germination has been amazing. There's loads of them there. There's also some lupins. Some lupins too. Yes. Now there is a story behind this. Mrs. W was actually sowing some lupins last year for an event that we needed to attend. And uh, she actually dropped some seeds onto the greenhouse floor. And around about January when we came in here this year, wasn't it? Were you thinking, whatever's coming up <laughs> in the borders? There's still another one just down here. Let me see if I can get to it. There's two. And there's another two. <laughs> And we couldn't work out what they were. So, Mrs. W, being naturally nosy, just thought, I'm going to pot those up and see what they are. I said they were weeds. <laughs> Shows you what I know. <laughs> but yeah, actually they're lupins. And they've grown on. And they've grown on quite nicely. Now, when it comes to harvests, 
Again, some things have worked really well and others haven't. But that was what's the idea of doing this? Because we haven't grown things and or, you know, over the winter period in the greenhouse or the polytunnel before. We've sort of got an idea what works best in which structure. Um, certainly in the greenhouse, the carrots don't work that well. Having said that, I do think it's because it's really dry in here and we probably just haven't been in here watering enough. You tend to forget during the winter months, you're indoors, it's raining outside. You don't come outside and these poor things go without water. Whereas in the summer months, we're out here all the time and always watering. So I think there is quite a bit of that. Having said that, I can see that on some of them, there are some tops starting to show. So we might well get some baby carrots, we'll have to see. But you can see that the shallots have been a huge success there. You can see that they've already split. And this one's got what, one, two, three, four, five, six. So they are actually, as I thought would happen, ahead of the ones in the outside bed. And we should be able to use these before they become ready. But equally before our onions become ready so that we've got some nice oniony taste. The radishes, as I said, we saw the ones outside, but you can see these ones, they're really, they're motoring on. And in the next few days, we're going to be able to enjoy those, as we're probably going to be able to with Mrs. W's lettuce. She's put some cut and come lettuce in this tub. I think she sowed that beginning of February. And you can see it's come on really quite nicely now. It's not going to be long before we can pick that and have some nice fresh green leaves. Equally, you can see the spring onions. They're doing really well. The garlic in the borders, that's done really well. It's looking good, healthy. Um, it looks better than what we have outside, although what I'm seeing outside, that's how I'd expect to see it. And I'd expect these to be looking a bit healthier. They've been undercover. They haven't been subject to the cold weathers, the frost and everything else. And also, I don't know if you remember, but we also plant some garlic into tubs. They're doing really, really well. And we'll follow those through to their harvest, hopefully sometime in July. And then lastly on this side, the spinach. The spinach is really coming into its own now. We've been having small harvests off this since probably, you know, through November, December. Very small harvest, but also, you know, very, very welcome ones. But now it's coming to its own. We're having to pick this all of the time. Virtually every day we come out here and pick some leaves. Well, this is the area that we made new dig last year. Um, and we did grow... You grew some lettuce and celery in here, didn't you? And things like that. So we were able to grow something during its first season. But now this season, as I said, when we were in the greenhouse, I'm going to use this space to grow any plants that I can where we can save our own seed. So I've got some broad bean plants that we're just going to pop in there. And like I say, that's what this bed is going to be dedicated for. The wigwam will go there and the peas can grow up. Now, here, these are the summer fruiting raspberries, and you can see, you can see why we call it spring. Everything is springing into life, and is looking really, really good. And if you watch the video uh, where we cut down or pruned the summer fruiting raspberries after they fruit and then get them down to a certain height and then tie them in. You don't want them to, because they will grow up here, but the wind will catch them and they could break them. So if you just cut them down a bit, you know, to a, we normally cut them down to about this, what, this height. That's going to grow away again. And then we have to, you know, when we cut the old ones down, we have to leave the new canes. And here you can see the new canes are starting to come. These will be carrying the fruit to your summer fruiting raspberries next year in 2024. These, this is what's carrying your fruit for this year, 2023. And then if you just look over there, you can see that the autumn raspberries that we cut down right at the beginning of February, they're already starting to shoot and sending up their new canes. Remember the Blackberry. The last time you saw this, we were chopping this down, pruning it back, taking out the old canes, tying in the new ones. 
Well, as you can see, this is now starting to sprout now. And it's going to start getting its leaves and then its blossom. So yeah, everything is springing into life. It's such a great time of the year. Black currant, Mr. Black currant, it's got his leaves out. You can see the buds are there. It's not going to be long until that starts to blossom. When we last looked at these gooseberries, when we made the video right at the beginning of the month of our top tips for the March garden, it was just starting to come into leaf. Look at it now, absolutely covered in it. And again, you can see all of its buds that are here. We're gonna have a nice crop of gooseberries. We did take the trouble this year to give this a good prune and to get it to the shape that we wanted. You can see it's the classic goblet shape because these plants were just approaching their third birthday and you know we want to now get those under control. We let it grow, get established, and now we need to get it to the shape. In future years, we won't have to be so drastic with the pruning. And this red currant, if you remember, this was another one that we needed to be quite strict with with the pruning. Sometimes you can't do it all at once, otherwise, you know, you do risk losing the plant. So, we've given it a good prune back last November, it'll have another good one this year, and then hopefully it will be sorted out. So we've been a bit lax. You can see this one here, if this continues to grow as it gets bigger, it's going to rub against this and you know, it'll make a wound which can then be open to disease. And I can see it's not going to be long before it is going to start releasing its leaves. It does tend to be a bit later than the black currant and the gooseberries. We don't tend to get these red currants until mid to late July. And of course, what we all hope for now is that as this blossom starts to come out, as we go into April, Hopefully we don't get any really harsh frosts because the frost, you know, can damage the blossom as we all know, we've all experienced at some point. So we always keep our fingers crossed now that we don't get, you know, a severe frost once this blossom comes out so that we do end up getting fruit. Plot five is where we grew our leeks. And you can see there's not many left. We actually put 80 leeks into the ground. so. Myself and Mrs. W have chomped along. There's probably about 12 left in here. So we've eaten a fair few since the back end of October. But we do like our leeks. Here in bed one, that's where the rest of our onions are going. It's another onion bed. It will mirror what we have down there. Um, I just need to be able to get out here and, well, actually, I'll be doing this after we've finished filming today. It was a bit wet during the week, so I couldn't get out to finish what we started down there. Now, this rhubarb that you see here, it's now starting to come back into life. And this is now in its third year, this crown. So this year, we should be able to pick our rhubarb. You can see a nice stem starting to come there, Mrs W. Look. Oh, yeah. oh. Nice and red, a little pink. Lovely rhubarb crumble. But then a real success story. And if you remember, but last March time, I think might have been early April last year. You'll find it on our playlist anyway. I decided I was going to sow some rhubarb. You normally buy it as crowns. But we decided to sow some seed, principally because I wanted a variety called Victoria. And at the time, I couldn't get crowns, so I thought, oh, let's give it a go from seed and see how it goes. And not an awful lot has happened, but actually, we planted this out last year, and look. It's there. There will be another couple of years or so before we can have any kind of harvest off that. It's only now approaching its first birthday. It's still a baby. And, you know, a bit like asparagus, you don't want to, if you, when you first plant your rhubarb, give it a chance to settle in. If you pick it, and certainly pick it all, the plant's going to be exhausted. You need it to be able to build itself up, to give itself enough strength in order that it can give you the harvest that you want. And bear in mind, once rhubarb does become established, you know, it's probably going to harvest for the next 20 years for you. And that was our deep dive into our early spring garden. So, 
We've planted quite a bit. There's still much more to plant. There's still plenty of seedlings in the greenhouse. There's still more to sow. And as we go into April, you know, it ramps up another gear and there'll be a bit more to do. I always find April one of those busiest months. March is, so can maybe, but April I always find one of the busiest months in the gardening year. Now do let us know in the comments down below how you're getting on. What have you planted out? What have you yet to plant out? What have you been sowing? Until next time. <laughs>